Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the third course of this uh, school. Uh, in this course, we'll focus on complex abelian varieties. And as the name suggests, the goal of the course will be to introduce the concept of abelian varieties or the complex numbers. We will do so first in dimension one. This will be the focus of the first part of the course where we will talk about complex elliptic curves and uh, complex stories that we can associate to it that will motivate the generalization that we will see later in part two, where we will focus on the goal of the course, that is complex abelian varieties, and uh, present the concept of the Jacobian of a curve. For the references and complementary materials, uh, be sure to check the um, platform associated to uh, the course, the Moodle, and I will introduce the references throughout um, the presentation. So let me uh, start with an introduction of the object that we will be focusing on, on part one. Okay, so um, by an elliptic curve, uh, we mean a genus one curve with a distinct point oh so we already saw this course uh, this curves on the first uh, course of the school and as you saw we can write them in what we call the Weyers transform that when we can write it in reduced form is of the form of the shape y squared equal x cubed plus ax plus b. Um, so if a and b are in a field k, then we say that e is defined over k. So uh, now let e1, e2, e3 be the roots of f of x. And by f of x, I mean the polynomial on the right side of the equation. Um, then we can take an isomorphism of P1 that maps um, E1, E2, E3 and the point at infinity Uh, a certain point lambda in the projective line and infinity and actually for this to happen we can take for example lambda equal e3 minus e1 divided by e2 minus e1 as an exercise you can write the isomorphism explicitly although this final expression kind of give it away so why is this interesting? Um, well, the interesting thing about taking this isomorphism is that then we have another form for the equation. Um, that we will call uh, the Legendre form which basically is y squared equal x x minus 1 x minus lambda and uh, 
good point about uh, this model is that we now have it depend only on one parameter, one before we had two. Um, and this will be interesting for some of the, the things that we will see next. So why are these curves so important and so well studied? Well, um, one has that the set of points of an elliptic curve is a group when we consider the following addition And I won't explain like all the details, but so you get an idea if you draw an elliptic curve over the real numbers, you get something of this shape, more or less. And so over this, um, this situation, if you take a point P, I'll do the line first so that <laughs> it all works out, and a point Q, you obtain another point, so now if you do the line that goes through this point and the point at infinity, which would be up here, we get this vertical line. This is what happens when you draw things approximately. So this other point where this line intersects will be the addition um, of P and Q. So this, is a, this one can prove formally that it's actually an operation on the set of points of the elliptic curve so it gives it a group structure. And this is something that happens um, for elliptic curves, but not for um, general genus curves, and will be part of the reason why we will need to define this other object, which is uh, abelian varieties. So some more notation and numbers that we will, and expressions that we need for elliptic curves are um, the following. So the first one is the discriminant. We write it with uh, capital delta and it's minus 16 times 4 times a cubed plus 27 times b squared. When we write it in terms of the coefficients of a Weierstrass form or we can also write it in terms of the the lambda in the Legendre form, and then we have 16 times lambda squared times lambda minus 1 squared, and the J invariant which is, we write it with a J, oh surprise, and it's this other expression where here delta is the discriminant as above, or in terms of the lambda in the Legendre form, we can also write it like this. Um, and well, these other quantities will be interesting um, for several uh, reasons when we study this function, uh, this family of curves, but the main one that we will be interested in is the following. We have the two elliptic curves E, E prime are isomorphic over 
over the algebraic closure of the field of definition, even on leaf, when we compute their J invariant, they are equal. So this gives us the definition of the isomorphism class of an elliptic curve. Um, and with this, we have a bit of an idea of this object that we will be working on. And uh, for the goal of this, um, of this course, what we will be focusing on from now on is elliptic curves that are defined over the complex numbers. Okay, um, so next we want to introduce uh, what we understand by a complex torus and how we can associate one to, to an elliptic curve. We will see the formal definition of, of complex torus and, and more details about this uh, later in the course, but for now um, we will uh, start by taking by taking uh, an elliptic curve in Legendre form and constructing uh, a complex torus, which is basically a surface in the shape of a donut. We will see the details later, but that's the image that you can have now. Um, and then we'll see how this is actually related to the structure of it. So, yeah, a complex torus associated Okay, so um, let E be an elliptic curve defined over the complex numbers Since we have that the complex numbers have characteristic zero and it's an algebraically closed field, we can take a uh, Legendre, sorry, we can take uh, an equation for E in Legendre form. So we can have E is equal to X, X minus one, X minus lambda. Um, and now we consider the following definition. So ideally, we want to take the set of complex numbers and we want to map it to the complex numbers by sending every point P to the integral between the distinct point O and P of the X divided by Y. Here, by the X divided by Y, well, this is a The x divided by y is actually a, a holomorphic differential form on the elliptic curve. And if we look at the expression um, for the equation, we can just see that y is the square root of x, x minus 1, x minus lambda. So we have all in one variable, and we can take this as the integral from 0 to x of dt divided by square root of t, t minus 1, t minus lambda. OK, so I want to define this, but is this well defined? Well, not really. Um, this is not, uh, I missed it. This is actually not a function. The 
The question is why not? Well, we have two issues here. The first issue is that the function that we are trying to integrate is multivalued in the domain that we have. Why do I mean by that? Well, we have a square root, and as you know, we can take it with either a positive sign or negative sign. Um, so that's a f the first issue that we have. And the second is that the result will depend on the chosen path. So depending on what path we choose to take to go from 0 to x, we will end up in different places. So um, we have to find solutions for this. For the first part, well, uh, let me first introduce a map that will be very helpful. And that's the projection from the complex torus sorry, from the elliptic curve to P1, that given a point x, y in the elliptic curve just keeps the x coordinate. This is actually a map that we are using when we do this step here. Um, and it is a double cover of, um, of the projective. It, yeah, it's a double cover of the projective line and it ramifies over the points 0, 1, lambda, and infinity of the projective line. Because remember that we are taking uh, the elliptic curve to be in the shape of the Legendre form. So the points where x is equal to 0, 1, and lambda is where we only have one value for y. When x is on any other value, we have the plus sign and the minus sign of the square root that we said before. OK, so now we are going to try to draw a bit the situation that we have here. Um, I'll do my best at hand drawing these things. Otherwise, through the magic of editing, we might have some nice plots on top of my face right now. <laughs> and the idea is the following. So here we have, right now I'm going to write the projective line as a plane, so basically as the complex plane. But remember that it includes also the point at infinity, and so that has the shape of a sphere. But drawing spheres is harder than drawing planes, so we'll stick with that and use some imagination. So this is this project line minus the point at infinity, basically. And here we have 0, 1, lambda and, well, minus one point. Let's not make it the point at infinity because I need that point. Let's just make it some imagination. I will just draw the point at infinity here. Is it here where I want it? Yes. And so the idea with the double cover is that we have two copies of this plane on top of it. And one would be like the positive square root possibility, and the other one would be the negative square root. And we have exactly the points that go above it. I'll do it here. And the idea is that in these points, actually, both planes touch, right? Because we said that for x equals 0, 1, lambda, and infinity, we only have one value for y. So in these points, both um, this point is identified with this one. 
this one with this one, etc. So the way of making um, the function that we are looking at uh, when with well defined, well, everything's a bit skewed, is by taking what we call um, branch cuts. So basically, we will cut um, between the points where uh, around where we have an issue. Uh, we will make some cuts, and we will translate this up here. So basically, you can think of this as once you cut it, you can identify one side of the cut with the same side of the cut on the other side, and the same for the next cut. So what we end up having is like in this plane, we have a small cut here. Like when you do the cut, you end up with a circle inside, right? So you have like something like this. And below you have the same thing. Well, the drawings is, are less similar every time. But the idea is that all of this comes from uh, complex analysis theory, but I'm just trying to give the intuition for how we end up with a donut shape thing. So basically, we would identify this side here with this side here, this side here with this side here, this here with this here. Sorry, with this here. I should use four colors. Let me grab some more. Not this box. So actually, we'll do the purple. This line here. With this line here. And this one here. With this one here. So basically, we identify these and stretch things. And what we end up creating here is what we, we will need a bit more imagination because the drawing starts to become a bit difficult. where now we have purple was behind, blue was in front, green was behind, and pink's in front. Okay, so we have these two volcanoes that have joined together at the tops. Um, but now remember that we said that I'm drawing planes, but they are actually spheres. So if you take this plane, and, or well, this plane, and just keep extending it until it meets that the point that we have now left out in this drawing, what you end up obtaining, it's nothing other than a donut shaped surface. Imagine that those match. It's kind of more a potato than a tor than a donut. Yeah, okay. And like for example, these two are the points that we just added from this drawing to this drawing. And now we have a donut shaped surface. So this is what we call the Riemann surface associated to the elliptic curve E. And the very magic thing about this surface is that now for every value um, 
so the function that we were considering before, the square root of um, x times x minus 1 times x minus lambda, like, is uh, now uh, well defined because we have both values in this surface, right? So if we take a point t here, we have this point will be square root of t, t minus 1, t minus lambda, and this one will be the same but with the negative. In a sense, that would be the interpretation. So now the function that we're looking at, it's no longer multi-valued because we have actually the representation of both points. So it should be well-defined. Well, I mean, this is a bit the intuition behind. But with this, we have now that after some cutting and gluing, we have the, the integral. from 0 to x of dt t, t minus 1, t minus lambda, it's now um, it's now single valued. Well, not the integral, but the expression inside. Um, so now the other problem that we have to deal with is the possibility of taking two different paths that go between two points. So um, let me draw three possible paths that go between, well, 0. We actually know what it is. And imagine that this point is t or is x. Let me draw now some points that go between the two some paths. One path that I can take is this one, which is gamma 1. It's a very direct path. Another one that I can take is this one, which is gamma 2. And another path that I could take is, um, mm -mm. how am I going to do this? I don't have much space. OK, I can go this way then back behind uh, and then back here. Is this one good? No, I should do it the other way. Sorry, let me try that again. So we will go from here to the other side and then loop around this arm of the donut and back. Yeah, we have three paths. So uh, what's the difference between taking uh, this path and this path? Well, if we consider the loop that they form, it's contractible. That means that I can make it go to nothingness. Um, so that means that there will be no difference between uh, choosing gamma 1 or gamma 2 as a path. The problem is when we take paths that are not contractible. Look now what happens if we take gamma 1 and gamma 3. Gamma 3 loops around this arm of the donut. So actually, we cannot really contract it to nothing. It will always be a ring around the, the, the arm of the torus. So um, those are the values that will actually give us the makes this, this integral be not well defined. So what we will want to do is identify all possible loops that are not contractible and quotient out by those so that uh, everything works. If we look at the torus again, um, so we only need, sorry, so we 
only need to consider non-contractible paths. And let me draw again a torus because in that one we already have a lot of things drawn. In this direction they look a bit nicer. Um, if we look at this, there are clearly uh, there are two examples of non-contractible paths that are very clear. One would be doing a loop on the short side because we have this hole in the middle that we cannot um, get around to. And the other one would be do the, lo the loop in the other axis somehow. Uh, which again we cannot collapse because we have the, the big hole in the middle of the donut. Um, and so these actually are the are two linearly independent uh, loops that we can take uh, on the torus and there are none more like every other is a combination of these two. Um, So we call the values of integrating the function um, along these paths the periods of E. So let me give them a name. We have that the short path is alpha, the long path is beta. Um, and therefore, we have that the first period would be the integral over alpha of the differential, the second period, the integral over beta of the differential. These are complex numbers, and because alpha and beta are generators, this will um, create this a lattice. So yeah, let me write that. These two paths are, in fact, generators of the first homology group of the torus and the difference between two paths of on the torus between two paths that go from um, 0 to p is uh, on the locus to some combination of alpha and beta. Um, yep, so this is actually uh, sorry, not alpha and beta, omega 1. Eh. Okay, and then, with this in mind, if we consider again the integral that we were discussing, we can say that the function that goes from the set of complex points to the complex numbers 
quotient lambda. Let me write more to the right. Consider again the function that we were defining before, the, from the set of complex points of the elliptic curve to uh, the complex numbers quotient lambda that we will define in a moment that takes a point p and maps it to the integral from o to p of dx divided by y. Now when we, what we want to do, and we would take this modulo lambda, what we have to quotient out by here is the result of doing an integral through any loop of this shape. And that's nothing else than the combination of omega 1 and omega 2 with exactly the same coefficients. So here we have that lambda is exactly n omega 1 plus m omega 2 for n m in the integers. And this is exactly the lattice generated by omega 1, omega 2 in the complex numbers. And this is where the torus comes from. So a complex torus, it's a complex vector space quotiented out by a lattice um, of full rank. We will see this formal definition when we talk about complex sources in higher dimension. But for now, um, this is the result that we have. And it turns out that this map is actually an isomorphism. So we want proof that it's actually an isomorphism now. Um, in the next section, we will introduce a function that is actually the inverse isomorphism and give the reference to uh, the literature when one can find the proof of, of the statement. But for now, um, the goal is that you get the intuition of the object and understand the construction that we are using. Um, yeah. So just as an exercise, to finish with this, show um, that the complex torus C modula, modulo lambda is isomorphic. to C quotient out by Z tau plus Z. So that is the lattice generated by a number tau and uh, one with tau a complex number such that the imaginary part of tau is positive. Um, so this you can do by taking the right uh, uh, complex analytic map and seeing that it satisfies all the conditions. I'll let you I'll let it for you to do. And from now on, we always take the lattices in this shape. Okay, so uh, for the next part of the the next part, what we are going to look at is the type of functions that we can define on a complex torus, and we will see why in a moment. So let me write the section: elliptic functions. And the virus stress p function and this is a fancy p that even has its own um, 
later. Uh, symbol. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, as I was saying, now we consider the functions that one can define on a complex torus. Basically, what we need is a function that is defined over the complex numbers that respect the lattice structure. And by that, what I mean is that if we take a z in the complex numbers and lambda in the lattice, then this is equal to the function um, without the lattice point for lambda in lambda, z in z. So basically, the taking two representatives of the same point in the complex lattice gives us the same result. Um, we say we call these functions uh, lambda periodic. And I mean, we are asking a lot of them. So the result that we have um, from complex analysis is that um, entire lambda periodic functions Um, are constant. This follows from Liouville's theorem, if I'm not mistaken, and one can see it with some complex analysis, but we won't go into the details now. It just means that these are not interesting. So the type of functions that we'll actually look at um, So we will look into uh, meromorphic uh, functions. Which we call elliptic functions. So there's a whole theory that one can study about these functions. Um, they define some trigonometric-like functions with some interesting properties. The one that we are interested in, though, is um, the Weierstrass pi function. So let lambda be a lattice. Then the Weierstrass p function associated to lambda is given by the sum. One over z square plus for every lambda in lambda different from zero, we have one divided by z minus lambda square minus one over lambda square, um, 
Yeah, and this is the function. And some things to have to know about this function. This is an even um, elliptic function. And it converges when you choose a, an area that doesn't contain the poles, um, which fall on the lattice. Okay. And why are we interested in this function? Well, um, it is quite relevant to the to the structure of the complex torus. So first we have that again for lambda a lattice. We have that every elliptic curve. is a rational combination of the p function and its derivative. Here when I refer of course to elliptic, sorry I write elliptic curve and I mean elliptic function. So here I mean meromorphic uh, functions that are periodic with respect to the chosen lattice. And so basically this tells us that it is enough to look at uh, the p bias stress function and its derivative and that uh, will give us every possible elliptic uh, function. And the second and most important result about this function for us is that for every z not in the lattice, the Weyer stress p function and its derivative. Satisfy the equation um, the derivative at z square is equal to four times the p function at z cubed minus g2 the p function at z minus g3 with G2 equal 60 sum for lambda in lambda, lambda different from zero of one over lambda to the fourth and G3 is equal to 140 sum of lambda in lambda different from zero, one divided by lambda to the sixth. Okay, so as I was saying, we have that this p function satisfies this equation with certain coefficients and I hope that the shape of this equation looks very familiar because it's very close to a Weierstrass equation and it's just a matter of changing um, some variables to get it there, um, to remove this coefficient. Uh, so the way that we get this relation is by looking at the Lorentz expansion of the Weierstrass p function around zero and using some other series called the Einstein series. If you are interested in the exact details, I will put the reference um, to the exact proposition in Silverman's book, which is one of the main references that we are using for this section and check the details. It's quite interesting but detailed work um, that it's not 100% relevant for what we are trying to do. 
um, what we really want to know is that they satisfy this equation. And this is what will motivate what we will give as the isomorphism between the elliptic curve and the complex torus when we go the other direction. So from the complex torus to the elliptic curve. Okay. So uh, now for the isomorphism claim. Again, that lambda in the complex numbers be a lattice. And let G2 that we can see as a function of lambda, G3, be as defined in the previous theorem. Then, y squared equal 4x4 minus g2x minus g3 is an elliptic curve. And the map phi that goes from C over lambda to the set of complex points of this elliptic curve that we uh, just defined. that take z and map it to the point, the projective point, um, the p-function at z, the derivative of the p-function at z, 1. So there is a point in the, in p2, uh, in p2, so we have the three entries, and we have that this map is a complex analytic isomorphism, of complex Lie groups. Meaning that it respects the group structure that we have both in the complex torus and in the elliptic curve as we defined it before. So this is exactly the inverse map to the map alpha that we defined in the previous section. And it is it looks like a great way of obtaining the elliptic curve when we are giving a lattice. Um, basically, yeah. A consequence of this is actually that for every lattice in the complex numbers, we can find an elliptic curve that is isomorphic to the complex torus given by the lattice, just by taking this construction. But the issue that we may encounter with this is that this is actually not effective in the sense that if we try to compute numerically this equation by taking a lattice and computing the sum that defines g2 and g3, uh, then it's not really effective. It's going to take a long time because despite the series being conversion, the speed of these conversions can become bad uh, very quickly for some examples. So what we want to do in the following section is actually to find an effective way of doing this association of an elliptic curve to a complex um, torus. But lastly, before I go into that, I want to give one more consequence of the existence of this isomorphism, and is that uh, this isomorphism uh, gives um, an equivalence of categories And 
And by gives, I mean gives in a loose sense. It means that it's the foundation for the things that we would need to work on or write um, to prove the, the equivalence. But, uh, but it's a, a very nice result. So the following categories are equivalent. The first one is elliptic curves over C as objects uh, with isogenies as maps. So we haven't um, given the exact definition of isogenies, but it's the type of morphism that one can take between elliptic curves um, when it's surjective. And we won't go into details, the ones that we have seen a bit more um, in this introduction to, to elliptic curves would be taking elliptic curves over C with complex analytic maps that fix um, that fix uh, the point at infinity, well, the, the distinguished point in the elliptic curve. In this case, if we take the Weierstrass model, this is the point at infinity. So that take O to itself. And finally, the last category is um, lattices up to Um, so basically with this, it's enough to imagine lattices as we said that we could take at them. So with basis one tau, um, when the imaginary part of tau is positive, that is what we mean by up to homotopy. Um, with uh, maps between one lattice and the other lattice being represented by the complex numbers such that alpha of lambda 1 is contained in lambda 2. Uh, and in this case, the map between the complex torsos would just be taking a point and multiplying it by alpha, and this would be well-defined in the complex torus uh, on the right side.